You know, we've been in a series of messages entitled, I Love My Church, and a few weeks ago I asked you to tell us why you love your church, and so many of you gave so many different things. I mean, a lot of them were like, you know, the pastor's really good looking, and no, that wasn't one of them, I promise. But you said so many, so many different things, and so we've kind of created this sermon series on some of the things that you said, and we talked about, we've really kind of centered this thing around some key words. I don't know if you remember these key words, but we looked at atmosphere, we talked about the right activities, and uh, we, we split that up in a couple of different weeks. But today I want to key in on the word authority. Everybody say authority. Everybody sometime in their life has rebelled against authority. Now, moms and dads, don't be looking at your teenagers right now, okay? There's time enough for that in the message. But we're going to look at the key word, authority. And so there's going to be a scripture on the screen. If you'll go ahead and pop that up. I don't remember if it's Romans 13.2 or Matthew 16. Yes, Romans 13.2. Let me go ahead and just share this verse with you. Consequently, whoever rebels, everybody say rebels. Rebels against the authority, say authority, authority. is rebelling against what God has instituted and those who do so will bring judgment. Wow, that's strong. Will bring judgment upon themselves. So here's the deal. Here's the deal. He says, consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment, judgment upon themselves. Now here's the deal. This umbrella today is going to represent authority. And so as long as we find ourselves under the authority of God, there is protection. But as soon as we get outside of God's authority, there's no longer any protection. How many of you have ever, you know, you, by the way, my wife, you know, she'll bring an umbrella with her. You know, I'm, I'm like, well, I don't have much hair. It's not going to mess anything up anyway, you know. And so sometimes she'll, she'll get down, and I'll try to sneak under with her, you know, but she's kind of hogging it. <laughs> and so I'm like, hey, baby, she's in the nursery. She's waving at me right now. Look, turn around, everybody look. Everybody wave at Tammy. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so she's like hogging it, and here I am, you know, trying to do this, and I'm getting my side all wet. But here's the deal. As long as we're under the umbrella, there is protection from outside. It's the same thing when it comes to the authority that God has placed over us. As long as we find ourselves under the authority, there's protection. But when we get outside of the authority, then the protection is no longer there. Go with me, if you will, to Matthew 16. It's on the screen, actually. Matthew 16, verses 13 down through verse 19. Notice what the Word of God says here. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Verse 15, but what, do, what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, of course it's Simon Peter, right? I mean, Simon Peter is always the first one to speak up. Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Simon Peter got it right. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, watch this, but I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell or Hades will not overcome it. Verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. We're going to come back there. Do not lose your place there. Now, I want to talk to you for the next few minutes today on authority. Because as we think about authority, it's really, it really is important when we think about the whole idea of our church and the health of our church and the growth of our church. There must be this structure set up, this authority structure set, set up. But now, here's the deal. Man, we live in a day in a society where there is a total rebellion against any and all kinds of authority. But you know, it comes natural to us to be that way. Because we have a sin nature. 
And if you'll go back and look sometimes in Isaiah chapter 14, in verse, uh, I think, 13 and 14, you see where Satan, watch this, Satan rebelled against the authority of God. You see, Satan was uh, not always Satan. He had a free will. His name was Lucifer while he was in heaven. And the Bible tells us in Isaiah and in Ezekiel and other places that Lucifer, who is now Satan, Lucifer was the worship leader of heaven. And he was in charge of all the worship to God. But there came a point in Lucifer's life where Lucifer said this, I no longer want to worship him, God, Yahweh, Jesus Christ, King of kings. I want to be worshipped myself. And so what he did was he rebelled against authority. Now there's rebellion in all realms of government. There's rebellion in the realms of the home. And yes, there's even rebellion in the realms of the church. 1 Samuel 15 in verse 23 says that, now this is a serious deal. Because the Bible says in 1 Samuel 15, 23, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So I want you to just kind of think with me today about the subject of authority. Because I believe that this is the, the key reason so many churches in our society, in our country, and around the world today are dead, they are dying, and they are void of the power of the Holy Spirit of God. It's because they have rebelled against the authority structure that God has set up in the church. Let me just tell you something. The church is not to be built upon tradition. Now, there's nothing wrong with tradition. There is something wrong with traditionalism. I remember one time I was pastoring a church. I won't call the name of it because it will get back. But I was pastoring uh, like my third church. And, and we were scheduling, you know, you know some of those churches where you have a, fall, a spring revival and a fall revival. Can I, any church people in the house, you know what I'm talking about? Spring revival, fall revival, you got to have it. No matter if you need it or not, you just got to have it because you got to have it. And so, so we were, it was coming up in the fall, late summer, and I had scheduled a revival with an evangelist. I love using evangelists. I believe it's a vocational gift. The, guy, the Bible talks about that. We're going to have another evangelist really soon. I'll tell you, tell you more about that. But I, but I had scheduled this guy, but he, they normally had it the third week of August. Every year, Nancy, the third week of August. I mean, since, you know, Methuselah, the third week of August. I didn't realize that. I didn't understand that. I wouldn't have understood it if, if they told me beforehand. But this evangelist had one week open. It was the first Sunday through Wednesday of November. I book it. I schedule it. I announce it. After the service, there is a called business meeting. How dare you schedule a revival for the first... What? <laughs> What's the matter? Why? They said, we got to have it the third week of August. But why? I don't know. we just always done it that way. You know, I did some investigation. By the way, guess when we had the revival? First week of November. <laughs> it's me, you know. It's just me. A little rebellion, maybe. I don't know. I did some digging, and what I found out was that the third week of August, it started off as a very good tradition. Because back in the day, anybody over the age of 60, would you raise your hand? You don't want to, but you remember back in the day, okay? So back in the day, before there was travel ball and baseball and softball and soccer and this and that and the other, back in the day, the social event of the year was going to church revivals. Now, all the old people said, y'all don't want to admit you're old, do you? I mean, that's just what you did. And so what, what they did in this particular small town was the Presbyterians had their revival the first week of August. The Methodists had theirs the second week of August. And the Baptists had theirs the third week of August so that they could all go to each other's revival and hang out and fellowship and eat. Baptist casserole. By the way, you know what Baptist casserole is? 
It's anything with rich crackers crumbled on top. You don't know what's underneath there, you know. <laughs> but all I'm saying is that was a good tradition. Tradition's not bad, but when traditionalism runs the church, it's bad. The church is not to be built upon and run by tradition. The church is not to be built upon and run by a group or a committee or a team. The wor- Listen, the church is number one. We're going to talk about authority. I'm going to share with you three things. Number one, Jesus Christ is the builder, and I ought to get an amen. amen. The church is about the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Whenever this church becomes about me, or the church becomes about the band, or the church becomes about a volunteer, or the church becomes about the place, or the church becomes about some stained glass or a steeple or crosses out in the yard or whatever, listen, friend, then we are not doing and being what God called us to do and be. The church is all about Jesus. Jesus is, Jesus Christ is the builder. Jesus is to be the boss of SoulQuest Church. Go back with me, if you will, to Matthew 16 and look in verse 18. Matthew 16 and verse 18. He says, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, everybody say rock. On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it or overcome it. Now, three things. Write these three things down. Number one, the church is built on him. The church is built on him. This is important. The Bible says, upon this rock. The church is to be built upon Jesus Christ. Now get this, not Peter, not me, not you, not the, I don't believe, not even the profession of Peter. I believe that the church is to be built upon Jesus Christ. A church that's not built on Jesus has no right calling itself a church. Now Peter is in the Greek the word petros, which means little rock, little rock. Remember the New Testament is written originally in Greek. And Aramaic, but Greek. And, and, and the word Peter, the name Peter means Petros or Little Rock. But then Jesus is the word Petra. How many uh, old time Christian rockers remember the. Uh huh, yeah. I knew you would, Dave. I knew you would. You're a rocker, aren't you, brother? Kind of, sort of. Yeah, amen. The thumbs up. And so, so Jesus means Petra, which means the rock or the massive rock. And what I believe that, turn it back, if you will. Uh, back to that scripture again, verse 18. Look what it says. Now watch this. I believe, he says, I, I, and I tell you that you are Peter. And I believe what Jesus is doing at that moment is Jesus is turning around and pointing his finger at himself. And he's saying, and upon this rock. Hey, Peter, you're Petros. But upon Petra, upon the massive rock, upon the rock, upon the solid rock, Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Friend, this is not Ronnie's church. It's not your church. It's Jesus' church. Amen. Good place for applause. Now look, Adam, you're going to sit on the front row. You've got to kind of lead the charge, okay? All right, the church, the church is to be built on Jesus. Number two, the church is by Jesus. He said, I will build my church. You see, Jesus is the force. He's the power. He's the, he's the life of the church. I'm glad. I'm so glad that the growth of this church does not depend solely upon the man in the pulpit or the people in the pews. I'm glad that the growth of this church depends upon the moving of the Holy Spirit of God and the power of God. Listen, friend, you look around. What we have seen in our midst in the last year, if you go back and look at statistics in church work and church life, what you're going to say is this has been a move of God, a miracle. You don't see this anymore. It's not because of me. It's not because of you. It's not because of our band. As great as our band is and as, as, as friendly and wonderful as you are, Bam, bam. Right? No, it's because of the Holy Spirit of God doing great things in our midst. The church is built on him. It's built by him. The church is built for him. Can I read one scripture? I'm not, do, do you have Ephesians chapter 3, 20 and 21 up on the screen? I'm not sure you do or not. No? Okay, t- turn there with me. I, I want to, 
I want you to see this. Ephesians chapter 3, 20 and 21. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Uh, that's, if you don't have it by now, just pretend like you do. Let me read it to you, just because of time. Now to him who is able to do it immeasurably more than we all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is in work within us, to him, watch this, to him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ, the Christ Jesus, throughout all generations, forever and forever. Amen. The church is built for him not for my glory not for your glory not for our but for his glory i have a real conviction at this point and i know that you do too i hope that you already know this but i i believe that anything that i do as a pastor that we do as a church that any saint song that we sing or anything it, receiving an offering take uh, giving and gifts and ministry teams serve teams uh jesus loves jackson it, it, so quite anything that we do friend it ought to be done watch this for the glory of God for the glory of God here's a question when Jesus said I'll build my church whose church is it there's a whole lot of churches that get in trouble at this point have you ever heard somebody say that's my church or that's the preacher's church or that's the deacon's church or that's the family's specific family they run that no it's not it's Jesus's church it's Jesus' church. It doesn't belong to any member. It doesn't belong to any person. No matter how long they've been or how much money they give, the church belongs to Jesus. To Jesus. Jesus will never... This is tweet worthy. Somebody, somebody tweet this. Jesus will never bless a church that he cannot boss. Some of you are tweeting. Jesus will never bless a church that he cannot boss. Here's the authority. Are you ready? The authority is Jesus. 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 Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. And listen, friend, here's the deal. And when we no longer put Jesus on the throne, then we have gotten outside of the protection of God. You know why so many churches are dying today? I'll tell you why. Because they're more concerned with what Deacon Bob thinks than what the Word of God says. So many churches are more concerned with a committee that rules and reigns and makes decisions than they are with what the Word of God says. And when they do that, and you guys, some of you have seen this time and time and time again. And that's why some churches, they run a hundred forever and ever and ever. That's why, now some of it's because of where they're located in their geographical position. But some churches never grow. They never reach people. They never, that God's power is no longer upon them. Why? Because they have gotten outside of the, this authority, this, this idea that Jesus Christ is the church. It's built for him. It's built by him. It's built on him. Can I get an amen? amen? Here it is, friend. Jesus. Jesus Christ is the builder. Number two, write this down. The Word of God is our director. Now, I'm going to take about three minutes here. The Word of God is our director. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now, here's the deal. When we get outside of Jesus being boss, then we are outside of the protecting hand of God. But also when we get outside of the Word of God being our direction, then we get outside of the protective hand of God. We get into the elements. Now friend, listen to me. The Word of God is our guideline. It's the truth. It has no error in it. It is God's Word from the very beginning to the maps. Can I get an amen? amen? Look what the Word of God says. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture. Everybody say all Scripture. All Scripture, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Word of God. The Bible. The Word of God is our director. Now, I, I, let me just say a couple of things here. The Word of God directs us in our marriage, 
in our parenting, in our government life. I believe we're to submit to our government as long as they're not asking us to do something contrary to the Word of God. You say, well, I don't, pay my, I don't believe in paying taxes. I don't believe they ought to get it. Well, don't. That's fine. Just go to jail. <laughs> Until we vote a president that abolishes the IRS. <laughs> I got an amen on that one, didn't I? I mean marriage. There's an authority structure in the marriage. We, we don't like, listen, it's the real S word. When you think about marriage, it's the real S word. Are you ready? Men, sacrifice for you. Women, it's a word a lot of our ladies don't like to hear today, but it's script, it's the word of God, submission for you. And I've never known a lady, a, a wife who would not be willing to, to, to submit to her husband if he was willing to sacrifice everything for her. I mean, it's the word of God. And don't, don't get to that place where you kind of boy and your husband right now, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and you're going, mm-hmm, you know. But there's, there's authority structure there's authority structure in the, in the marriage and in the family. And the Bible says the children obey your parents. And then Romans 13 and verse 1, it talks about uh, obeying your government. Let, let's look at that real quick. Uh, Romans 13 and verse 1. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. So there's the, the, we've we got to listen and obey the Word of God and not rebel against what the Word of God says. Jesus Christ is the builder. God's Word is the director. And then real quickly, the pastor is the spiritual leader. This pastor is the spiritual leader. Take your Bibles, if you will, and go to 1 Peter chapter 5. Are those scriptures on the screen? 1 Peter chapter 5 and verses 1 through 4. To the elders among you, now, it's interesting in this passage because he gives three words. And, and, and they all go together. It's almost like God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There's three in one, but they, you know, they, they work separate, but they mean the same thing. What's, it's interesting, it says, to the elders, somebody say elders, among you I appeal as fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory of, to be revealed, be shepherds, somebody say shepherds, of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Verse 3, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when, you, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade Oh, wait, there's three words, and the other word is the word overseer, and you can find that word if you look in the New American Standard or in the King James Version. But the Bible says that the pastor is to be the spiritual leader. Now, I believe that if the church is going to grow, it must have a healthy relationship between the pastor and the people. I had a, <laughs> man, I had a, a pastor say one time, I said, man, man, preach, man, ministry is so tough. If you didn't have to deal with people, it'd be okay. <laughs> right? The, I mean, there must be. I mean, we got churches all across this country. Man, I get phone calls all the time. Pastor, please pray for me. I've got to get out of this place. They're killing me. And I've got people that say, man, listen, Ronnie, please pray that God would lead our pastor away from us. It goes both ways. But there must be a healthy healthy relationship between the pastor and the church. Peter here describes the pastor and his people as a, as, a, as a shepherd over a flock of sheep. Every one of us has a flock over, that we're over. Some of you, we've got, we, we, we have serve teams here. Some churches have committees. I don't like committees. I like teams because committees sit around and talk and talk and talk and talk and sometimes never get anything done. But I like serve teams because you serve. And so some of you are leaders over serve teams. And so that, that, that they're your flock. So you're, you're a shepherd over that. And some of you are parents. God has made you shepherd over your family, your children. And I could go on and on. But Peter here is going to speak to the leaders of the church, the pastor. So let's look at the role of the pastor. 
And I share these with you because I want you to pray for me that I'll always be the pastor that God would want me to be. I'm not a perfect pastor, by far. But I want to serve God, and I want to serve people. And I want to see people's lives touched and changed. And, and so he gives us three words. Number one, the pastor is the elder. Now, right out beside it, this speaks of spiritual maturity. Now, elder is the Greek word presbyteros. Now, guess what word we get from that in the English? Presbyterian. Presbyterian. So if you've got a Presbyterian background, you know, if that's your background, then you're scriptural. Amen. The elder is the, is the word presbyterian. We get presbyterian. I am, the Bible, a presbyter of this church. It doesn't mean elderly. It simply means it's a term of respect or esteem. In other words, it speaks of spiritual maturity. I mean, I hear people say all the time, you're too young to be a pastor. Not, not now. They used to say that. <laughs> you're too young to be a pastor. Well, let me remind you that Timothy was an elder and he was a young man. I pastored my first church. I was 23 years of age. I didn't know what I was doing, and neither did they when they called me. And I found out after the fact it was a mistake. No, it wasn't really. I, I, I never forget when I pastored my first church. I was a student at Union. And Tammy and I went, and we met with this pastor search committee, I guess is what you call it. And, and we met, and we, we preached our trial sermon, and they voted us in. I don't know what the vote was. It may have been 51, 49. I don't know. But they voted us in. And we went home, and I think we met my father-in-law, mother-in-law for dinner or went to their house or something. And my father-in-law said, well, what's he going to, well, they going to pay you. I said, I don't have any idea. Man, I was just pumped about preaching, you know. I pastored my first church when I was 23. And now I'm old, you know. But the pastor is elder, but it's not talking about a, a, a physical age. It's talking about more of spiritual maturity. And he says here, number two, the pastor is the shepherd. The pastor is the shepherd. And you can see this in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2. It speaks of spiritual ministry. You see, the elder speaks of ministry, uh, spiritual maturity, but then the shepherd speaks of spiritual ministry. The shepherd needs to understand the sheep. The shepherd... It's to defend the sheep. The pastor basically is the secretary, secretary of defense in the government of the church. Paul said to the elders of the church, be on guard. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. There's that word we're going to look at next. To shepherd the church of God which is purchased with his own blood. Nobody will ever come and preach in this pulpit unless, man, I know who they are, I know what they believe, they're going to come in and preach the word of God. Why? Because we got to protect the pulpit. we got to protect what's going on because we want to make sure that it's coming from God's word. You see, the pastor is elder, the pastor is shepherd. He defends the sheep. He understands the sheep. He directs the sheep, John 10 27, my sheep hear my voice, and they know me, and they follow me. The pastor has been given the responsibility of leading and directing the flock. The pastor is the, to lead and guide the church, just as the shepherd is to lead and guide the flock. See, three sad things that we see in our churches today. Three sad things. Number one, a flock that doesn't have a shepherd. I've seen those before. Some churches just think, well, we don't need a pastor. We don't need a shepherd. What we need is just a preacher, paid preacher. You know what I call that? A hireling. Churches that don't, you know, they, they, they don't have a pastor. Or they, maybe they don't want a pastor. Number two is a church who won't follow the shepherd. He's trying to lead. I've been in those churches before. I wanted to do what God called me to do, and I wanted to lead. And many rebelled against where we were going as a pastor and staff and there's churches out there this flock who won't follow the shepherd and then there's the flock who has the shepherd but the shepherd refuses to lead you ever been in one of those before i mean we have churches just like that churches without a shepherd churches that won't follow the shepherd and churches who have pastors who are so mild-mannered and weak that the church winds up having to lead them Man, we got some pastors out here that are afraid 
to take a leadership role because they're worried they might get fired. I say, listen, guys, if you're worried about getting fired from that church, then maybe God will get you a good church. Amen? I mean, the pastor is to lead. That's what God's called him to do. The pastor, shepherd, is to dis, uh, discipline the sheep. 2 Timothy 4 and 2 in Titus 1.13, the pastor, shepherd, is to develop the sheep. If I, could, if I could really boil down the ministry of the pastor in two words, here it is. Are you ready? It's to lead and feed. Those are good things. Lead and feed. And then lastly, the pastor is the overseer. Now, it's the word episkopos. You say, what? Episkopos. Guess what English word we get that from that? Epis. Yeah, episcopal and episcopal. The episcopal church. And so the word overseer is episkopos. We get episcopalian. means to oversee, to overlook the affairs of the church. The church has, was never meant to be run by committees. The church was never meant to be run by deacons. Most churches that have deacons think that their job is to tell the pastor what to do. And if they would look in the Word of God, somebody better say amen here. When they look in the Word of God, they find out that a deacon is supposed to deek. Y'all don't even know what that means, do you? I don't either. It just sounded good. The deacon is supposed to serve the people. Wait on tables, the Bible says. Serve. Well, I'm too good to serve. Then you're too good to be a deacon. The overseer. The church is to be overseen and directed and administrated by the pastor and his staff. The pastors are to be leaders, not dictators. You ever known a pastor that's just a dictator? Here's, our, here's, our, here's how we do it here. We refuse to be micromanagers. You ever been around a micromanager? Maybe he asks you to do something and then he just stands over you. Don't think, that, that drives me nuts. If you want me to do it, back up and let me do it. Let me fail. It's okay to fail. When you fail, jump into something expecting to fail. Because we all fail, but when you fail, fail forward. Not, micromanagers, man, micromanagers, it's been determined they cannot grow an organization or a church over 200 people. It's just impossible. Why? Because they want to be in charge of everything. Come to me and let me give you permission before you do anything. That's not the way we operate here. The way we operate is we want to find good people who are gifted in certain areas and give them the baton and let them take off and do what God's called them to do. That's our style. We're, listen, we're, we don't believe in dictatorship type ministry. We want you to get plugged in and participate. It's one of our core values and run and serve God. It was exciting today because today was our first time for new volunteers to come this morning. And we had several that came and serving in different areas and different capacities. We want, before it's all said, now we want 100% of people who attend Soul Quest Church to be involved and on a serve team, serving God and serving the church. Now the Bible says, and I want to just close with this. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 17, that pastors will one day give an account to God for their leadership. Well, I don't, listen friend, I, I read that with fear and trembling. And I take that very serious. And one day, I'm going to give an account. I'm going to, you're not going to stand before God about Soul Quest Church. I am. One day, I'm going to stand before God about how we led and how we ministered and who we won and who we served and who we taught and who we led, who we fed. We're going to stand before God. I'm going to stand before God and give an account. And I take that very seriously. And I, I just ask you to just pray for us. Churches, friend, I believe that are growing are churches that allow their pastor to lead. Jim Henry was the former pastor, the late pastor. He's still living and he's doing some conferences. But he's a mentor. He mentors and pours his life into men, pre young preachers. Several years ago, uh, after he resigned from First Baptist Church Orlando, which is a mega church, he came to Tennessee and he said, hey, give me some of the up-and-coming movers and shakers in your state. Talk to, to the state convention. And and he gave him several names, and he gave him my name, and he said, and, and there was 10 of us. We met in Nashville in the church, in a conference room. They had recliners in there and just, you know, just chill out and drinks and, not drinks, drinks, but Diet Cokes and ice water. 
and bologna sandwiches. Oh, and we just had a good time. And for two days, 48 hours, we sat and, and, and we just, man, Pastor Jim, tell me, how do we do this? How do we do that? What's the best way to do this? How's the best way to lead? Jim Henry, man, a godly man, awesome man. This is what he said. Now, I, I want to share this with you, and I want to ask you, would you pray that these traits will be in my life? Jim, Jim Henry shared five traits of a good godly pastor. He said, pray the, he said, this is what you need to have. Number one, love Jesus. Now, these, these may just sound simple. Love Jesus. Just love Jesus. Number two, love people. Love saved people, love lost people. Love people. Love Jesus. Love people. Stand for convictions and don't run from the issues. Number four, know your vision. If you don't know it, find it for the church and then communicate the vision to the people. What's good? Love God. Love Jesus. Love people. Stand for convictions. Don't run from the issues. Number four, find the vision of God for the church and communicate it. And number five, I like this one the best. I like all of them. I guess I better say I like Jesus best because that's the best one, right? So number one. Love Jesus. I, that's the best one. But then number five, when you blow it, admit it. Because guess what happens in pastors' lives? They blow it! When you do, just admit it. Man, we've made so many mistakes. So many mistakes. We've made little mistakes. We've made big mistakes. And we're learning as we go. Listen, friend. Pastors are just like you. You've got to be lifelong learners in everything you do. Lifelong learners. Kyle, let me pick on you a minute, can I? You all mad at each other? You got to see between you? Okay. Kyle is in the swamps all day. I'm just kidding, man. Kyle is, Kyle, I guarantee you, you're in the swamps a lot, aren't you, brother? Don't ask you, it's too long a story, but he's in the swamps almost every day. I bet you learn something new every day, don't you, brother? You got to. Whatever business, whatever thing you're in, you got to learn. You got to be a lifelong learner, and we do that in the ministry. We got to learn, learn, and when you mess up, you just admit it. Here's a question. Madison, will you come or somebody come and play something for me? We're talking about authority. When we're under the authority of God, when we're under the authority of God, we're protected by God. But when we get outside of the authority of God, there's no protection. And you're going to be faced with the elements. Somebody once said this, this is probably tweet worthy, but it's probably too many characters. You ready? He's, somebody said, we need to get under the things God has put over us so we can get over the things God has put under us. Amen? One more time. We need to get under the things God has put over us so we can get over the things God has put under us. God has given us an authority structure. Jesus Christ is to be the builder. The church is not built on me or Madison or Austin or the band or any of our serve teams or anybody else. It's built on Jesus. It's built on Jesus. And when it's no longer built on Jesus, let's shut the doors, shut the thing down and say, forget it. It's all about Him. It's all about Jesus. And when we get outside of that, we've gotten outside of the authority of God. God's Word is our director. We've got to look at it, study it, meditate it upon it, live by it, act upon it. Let it be our decision maker. Obey it. If we decide we can do it better without God, we have gotten outside of the protection of Jesus is to be the builder. The Word of God is to be the director. The pastor is to be the spiritual leader. God has called us here to do something. The vision is so much bigger than we are. This vision God has given me is so much bigger than we are. As a matter of fact, when I first felt what God was calling us to do, I was afraid to put it on paper. Because I was afraid people were going to say, Ronnie, you can't do that. But guess what? Ronnie can't do that. We can't do that. But God can. God can. 
So are you with me? Are you with me? Can we determine in our heart of hearts, in our church, in our home, in our family, to stay under the authority structure of God? Because if we do, the protection and the favor and the blessings will continue to roll on in. And Father, I, I want to tell you something. I, I want the Father so bad, so bad, so bad to do something that people look at and say, wow, I cannot believe. They, they'll know that that did not come from Ronnie Coleman. They'll know it didn't come from Soul Quest Church. They'll know that had to have been a God thing. And as long as we stay under His authority. Folks, listen, I'm going to tell you. It's going to blow our 